Jim Dempsey, uh, who is the policy director for the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Jim is well steeped in, in Fourth Amendment issues and has been a longtime advocate of personal privacy and civil liberties. Uh, Jim has literally wrote the book on the Fourth Amendment. And without further ado, let me give it over to Jim for a presentation on law enforcement access to location information. Jim? Thank you, Tim. And I'm going to um, try to keep us on schedule here and um, discuss an issue that has been floating around here, which is the uh, specific question of law enforcement access to location information and the standards that should apply to that and how companies should respond when the government comes calling, as the government inevitably will. Now, this is the uh, source of our privacy rights vis-a-vis -vis the government. As you know, the Constitution doesn't actually use the word privacy, but the Fourth Amendment, uh, you can call it uh, archaic, you can call it uh, expansive, uh, you can call it inspiring. Uh, this is the source of the privacy uh, rules vis-a-vis -vis, uh, government access to information. Now, as we've heard, and the issue that uh, this uh, industry and this uh, technology is facing is the same being faced by many other sectors, which is the government clearly has compelling interests in accessing uh, information, uh, law enforcement uh, interests, uh, counterterrorism and national security uh, concerns, child safety, emergency services, all have a legitimate interests in location information. And the Fourth Amendment does not put any information off limits. There is nothing that the government cannot get about you. The question is, and what we worry about in a democratic society, are what are the checks and balances? What are the circumstances under which the government can get information? And how do we put around the government's power the kinds of rules and criteria and uh, limitations that are really the basis of our protections? And there are many issues buried in the words of the, of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, what is a search? What is a seizure? Uh, what is a uh, unreasonable search and seizure? Uh, when is a, a warrant required? What is probable cause? What is particularity? But the, the challenge that uh, this industry is facing, and as I said, many others are facing, is how do you take these words from 1791 and apply them to this. Now, there are, I've identified and, and talk about six wonderful, powerful, uh, increasingly pervasive technologies that are completely disrupting the, the privacy framework that has been built up uh, over the past uh, 200 years and in a way particularly over the past 40 uh, years. You could uh, quibble with my list, you could uh, come up with a seventh, but basically there are some major rapid developments that are breaking the, the paradigms upon which our privacy protections are based, and right in the middle of this is location awareness. Uh, Another one, that, and, and these are all interrelated, of course, uh, increasing storage power, the ability to search and retrieve information, uh, sensor networks, the, the fast track or easy pass system is an example of a sensor network that uh, many of us have in our cars, the little RFID uh, device, and the government has built a system of uh, sensors to collect information about that. Uh, video cameras that are now increasingly pervasive, both government and uh, private, on uh, the streets that we pass or a sensor network. The most powerful sensor network probably is, what, um, 160 million of these things. I have a, I'm a cheapskate, so I have a sort of an old-fashioned one, but um, 160 million of these devices in the hands of people, increasingly uh, GPS-enabled, photograph capabilities, uh, internet access, 
uh, basically the collection of a huge amount of information and it's increasingly interoperable, et cetera. So we've heard about some of the uh, uses. Uh, look, uh, this is sort of an asset tracking uh, service, uh, fleet management, et cetera. Uh, Sprint has its family locator service, a combination of the cell phone and a web-based interface so that the parents can check on the uh, location of their children, uh, receive uh, periodic email updates, as well as being able to log on uh, in terms of uh, locating uh, the carriers of phones that have been registered in the system. Uh, OnStar, the uh, GM and now other uh, car manufacturer system, which is, uh, includes a GPS and a cell phone uh, link, wonderful navigation emergency uh, service. Uh, a whole set of applications in the commercial sector. This was a product that uh, IBM Lotus was about to uh, uh, launch. Uh, this was the announcement from a couple of months ago. But it included a uh, social networking capability, which also had a uh, location-based capability, allowing you to find other members of your team uh, in your uh, work environment. Uh, Dodgeball has been mentioned, uh, now owned by Google. Uh, an older service, uh, I'm not sure where it stands now, Huat, another sort of uh, both dodgeball and uh, uh, Huat, of course, uh, self-registered systems. I think Huat was bought by uh, Yahoo. Clearly, huge amount of effort being um, uh, put into the development of these services and the combination of uh, technologies, both the GPS, the photographic uh, tagging, the uh, various uh, sensor uh, networks that are being created to, to collect this information. Very powerful, very exciting, and largely outside of the legal framework that we have created in terms of when a government can get access to this information under what standards. Now, the basic rule is whatever you have, the government can get. Whatever you collect, whatever you store, the government somehow can compel you as a service provider to turn over. The only question, and it's not a small question, is what are the standards? Now, the government, as I said, has come calling. This is just one example of a court opinion by a magistrate out of Texas relating uh, to uh, use of, uh, in this case, a court uh, government request to get a cell phone, uh, cell site location. Now, there are a couple of basic fault lines in the way that the courts up till now have addressed privacy. The first fault line is between records that you hold versus records that are stored on a network. Going back to uh, the 1970s, the Supreme Court held in a series of cases that once you let information off of your phone, whatever's stored here on my phone, if the government wants to get it, they either have to serve me with a subpoena, in which case I have time to, to normally 10 days to respond. I can challenge that. Uh, I can. Uh, seek to quash the subpoena. If they want to seize it immediately, uh, they need a search warrant issued by a judge based upon a finding of probable cause, the sort of highest constitutional standard. Same for anything that I have on my laptop with me. I still have one of these old-fashioned things. Again, I'm a bit of a cheapskate, as I said. But if they want to get my calendar, they've got to come to me with a subpoena or uh, to seize it immediately, come to me with a search warrant and get that information. Once that information moves out of my possession onto, uh, into the hands of a third party, into the hands of a business entity, if you look back at the cases from the 1970s, I have no Fourth Amendment uh, right in that information. I voluntarily disclosed it to a third party, and that third party can, can voluntarily disclose it to anybody and can be compelled to turn it over with a mere subpoena. This is the business records third party doctrine. Now, this was of 
limited significance when data was stored in paper, it was hard to retrieve, hard to transfer, hard to analyze in large volumes. If the government wanted to get it, they had, sometimes would back up a, a, a moving truck to, to the office and the, the, the banker's boxes would just be loaded onto the, the, the truck and it would have to all go back and be analyzed. The Supreme Court also held in the 1970s that certain data in transit, contents of your communications are highly protected by the Constitution, the Supreme Court ruled, your email and the content of it, the content of your voice communications, your text, your IM, almost all, while in transit, highly protected, but the signaling or routing information the Supreme Court held is not protected at all. And this was back in the era of rotary phones. Uh, the government, uh, the Supreme Court said, well, you know that you are disclosing your uh, dialing information to the telephone company and they use it uh, to process your call and you sort of know this and therefore you've lost your privacy interest in it. This is the transactional records doctrine. Again, limited uh, implications when transactional data didn't reveal very much about you. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, thought that in 1979 that uh, it didn't identify the parties to the communication. It didn't even identify whether the communication had occurred. Um, of course, when all that information, again, originally the pen registers punched little holes on a piece of tape to indicate the, um, the number that was being dialed, hard to analyze, hard to work with, and it was easy to distinguish between those little clicks on the rotary phone that in indicated the, the dialed numbers versus the content. Now, the rule that signaling or routing data, that is the non-content, and data that you voluntarily disclose to a third party, these two rules take on huge significance when so much information is stored on the network. As uh, Larry Maggot explained, the, the, the power of these services comes from the fact that they are network-based and that they are not uh, device-based. Uh, this has huge implications. And the courts are struggling just on the question of what is the uh, rule for government access to cell site location information in real time. Uh, cases have begun to percolate up. Almost all of these are U.S. magistrate judges' decisions. It's the magistrates who sort of are the, 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 the grunt uh, workers uh, on uh, processing government demands for information, search warrants, uh, uh, Title III orders, which are content interceptions, and pen register uh, requests. And the government has been trying to use the relatively low standard of the pen register to get location tracking information. Uh, so far, a majority of the uh, magistrates who have addressed this question have said that's not good enough. You need the higher standard of a court uh, warrant based upon a finding of probable cause, these courts have rejected the notion that the location tracking information is just this unprotected uh, transactional data in which you have no constitutional uh, uh, privilege. But this issue is not over at all. Um, as I say, the Justice Department is waiting uh, for the right cases to appeal. Most of these they haven't appealed. Um, when they find a, a terrorist who's a, also a drug trafficker and a child abuser, they will uh, appeal. And um, now the courts actually are a little bit confused uh, and, and stumbling their way through this. There's no need to really read all of this. But um, generally speaking, uh, going back, courts had ruled that you have no privacy for sort of what you disclose in public places, your presence in a public place, you have no privacy interest. But at the same time, uh, the Supreme Court has held that uh, just because something is publicly disclosed, like your criminal history records, doesn't mean that you lose your privacy interest in it. And in the Kylo case of a couple of years ago, which was the infrared sensing case, a decision by a quite conservative Supreme Court, they held, again, that the fact that the police were not uh, trespassing or not entering into the sort of protected zone of the home, but were using uh, technology to 
enhance their ability to collect information. Uh, the Supreme Court found that there was a search or seizure, that there was a reasonable expectation of privacy in, in that case, what was just the heat being um, uh, vented out of your house, almost waste, something that you were trying to get rid of, and yet the infrared allowed it to be uh, 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 collected and used and to draw knowledge from it in a way that the Supreme Court held did implicate the Fourth Amendment. Congress has, so, so this is going to work its way through the courts, and the courts are going to continue to struggle along to try to fit that language from 1791 onto the new paradigm of this technology. Um, Network-based services, most of the most, uh, of the most important information about our lives not held exclusively in our possession, but stored on networks, and the increasing value and significance and uh, power of the transactional information, which previously had looked like it was relatively unimportant, becoming much more uh, revealing about our uh, activities, becoming much more commercially valuable. And how do we fit this new kind of information into the uh, traditional paradigm? Congress has struggled, too. The CPNI rules in uh, 1996 said that uh, customer proprietary network information, that is the signaling information, this information which is constitutionally unprotected, uh, Congress said would be statutorily protected and that it could not be uh, disclosed. That was amended with the Markey Amendment to explicitly include location information as CPNI. It is uh, covered by this. However, except is required by law. You cannot disclose it. But we don't know what the law is. We don't know what the rule is for disclosure of a CPNI. The courts are confused as to what uh, paradigm it fits within. Also, interestingly enough, uh, the 1996 law only applies to a telecommunications carrier. Only a telecommunications carrier is subject to the CPNI rules. It was interesting when I went to the website for Helio, the first thing that pops up here in their sort of a flash display is, we are not a phone company. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. It's actually an interesting question as to whether they are or are not a phone company. They provide dial tone, uh, so in that sense they are. But clearly, Looped is not a telephone company. Looped uh, does not uh, provide uh, dial tone. So they are outside of the CPNI uh, rules, and uh, I think, uh, outside of the uh, well, Congress's 1996 attempt to regulate this transactional information. Companies are reverting, in a way, to privacy policies. The best privacy policy in the world will yield to a subpoena. Nobody is going to go to jail for contempt of court in order to adhere to a privacy policy. Every well-drafted privacy policy says anyhow that we will comply with uh, legitimate law enforcement demands or comply with lawful uh, demands. Uh, poorly drafted privacy policies say things like we will comply with government requests. Um, in my opinion, really poorly drafted ones say we will do with your information what we want. <laughs> uh, it's interesting here, I, I, the Sprint one, I actually think, uh, it, it's a wonderful service and a wonderful company, but I think they go a little too far in the other direction, and they try to say that nobody other than the user can uh, get access to your location information. Uh, I just don't think that's technologically correct. Clearly, the systems operator knows where the information is and can disclose it, and they seem to suggest that um, only persons that the account holder authorizes, I guess the account holder somewhere in the terms of service has authorized the company to disclose the information. Now the FTC, interestingly enough, might have something to say about this as well. One of the interesting things is if you're not a telecom carrier, uh, then you fall, under the, you fall out of the jurisdiction of the FCC, but you, then you fall into the lap of the FTC, which is begun to build up what one would call sort of a common law of privacy. A Microsoft Passport case and the Eli Lilly case were cases where companies had made an explicit privacy promise 
to their customers saying, we will protect your information, and then ended up not doing a good job of it. The FTC said that is an unfair and deceptive trade practice to promise to protect somebody's privacy and then not do so. What's interesting is that in the BJ uh, Wholesale Club and the DSW shoe case, the company did not make an explicit privacy promise, and yet the FTC still found that they were engaged in an unfair and deceptive trade practice by not adequately protecting their customer information. BJ's had to do with uh, the transmission in the clear uh, from the cash register to the back office of uh, credit card information and for failing to adequately protect that sensitive information, uh, BJ's was found to have violated the Federal Trade Commission Act. DSW is particularly interesting because the violation there was keeping information after it was no longer needed. DSW kept credit card information after the, the, uh, the transaction had been processed. And they kept it longer than they needed to. It was vulnerable, it was compromised, and keeping the information longer than necessary was found to be a violation of the, of the law. Now, there's a movement in the opposite direction which is the data retention issue. This is an amendment uh, introduced last year by uh, Congresswoman to get it, didn't pass, but the issue will undoubtedly be back again this year, which is the proposal from the Justice Department to compel some category of service providers, yet not fully defined, to keep some category of customer identifying or transactional information not yet fully defined either. This will be a major tug and pull between the impetus on the one hand to not keep information any longer than is necessary for business purposes versus keeping it uh, at the demand of the government. Now there is a solution space here. There's no silver bullet. We're not going to have a single law, a single privacy policy, or even a single, single technology design that will um, address these problems. But with the people in this room and the people in this industry working both in terms of how to design the technology, uh, Mark Jacobstein talked about what they keep and what they don't keep, um, the user empowerment and giving the user control, thinking about how technology is designed, the industry best practices and uh, the law, we can find a way to take this um, value, this principle, this sort of foundational uh, concept in our uh, society and meet the legitimate needs of government while also empowering users and creating the kind of trust that is necessary uh, for this technology to truly flourish. So I welcome, uh, CDT welcomes your participation in this effort. It's ongoing already. It is going to continue. It needs to accelerate. And I think through dialogue, through events like this, through other uh, kinds of uh, interaction, we can find that right balance of interest here, develop the kinds of clear laws, policies, design the technology in a way that protects users and meets the other societal needs. Thank you.